Today was day five of the Julian Assange extradition hearing, which is taking place at the Central Criminal Court in London, also known as the Old Bailey. Now, they had adjourned the hearing until today because of scares of a COVID outbreak or something, but it turns out that junior lawyer who was on the uh, prosecution team, she tested negative, so everything was okay. But, you know, they came into court this morning. Everyone was wearing masks. Uh, Julian was wearing masks, the defense and prosecution teams. And for some reason, they said they couldn't, or they had trouble, rather, finding a mask for Julian? What? Why would you have trouble finding him a mask? You've got him locked up away in, in prison in Belmarsh. I mean, again, I, I don't understand these kinds of statements. I, I don't know what that means. They had trouble finding him a mask. What, what does that mean? Anyway, um, the judge, Vanessa Baratzer, she said that masks are not compulsory in the court. Again, what the hell? Uh, nonetheless, uh, thankfully, people seem to be taking it a bit more serious. You know, after all, this whole thing was postponed all the way from February until September, until now, because of COVID. So you'd think that they would take these, this a bit more seriously and implement more precautions. Nonetheless, um, they came in this morning and, you know, straight away, the first thing they did is they brought in an expert witness, right? So they, they brought in... Uh, Hold on, let me pull it up as picture for you so you can get a glimpse. There we go. Eric Lewis, right? So he's also from Reprieve. If you recall, last week we had uh, Stafford Smith, Clive Stafford Smith, who also testified. And he's also from Reprieve, one of the founders. And, you know, Reprieve is an organization that has uh, worked with Guantanamo Bay detainees. They specify their experts in international law and human rights. And so he's also from the same organization, and he came to give his testimony about this, this hearing. And uh, the first uh, to cross-examine him, to question him, were the defense, right? So let's go through this. Uh, let me pull up my notes over here. Again, if you're not following on Twitter, I'm doing live coverage um, of the trials. So definitely, definitely go and follow. You can keep up with that. So, okay. Um, you know, Lewis, just like... Every one of these uh, expert witnesses really is a seasoned uh, veteran in, in all things human rights and journalism and, and um, international law. And, you know, Eric Lewis, by the way, don't get it confused with James Lewis of the prosecution. So James Lewis, QC, he's leading the prosecution team. They have the same surname, but they're not related, okay? James Lewis is leading the prosecution on behalf of the United States Department of Justice. Eric Lewis is today's expert witness, okay? So I referred to him as Lewis the entire time, where, just for today, right? Um, so when I say Lewis, I'm talking about Eric Lewis, right? So, you know, this guy, he's graduated from uh, Cambridge. He's lectured at Oxford. He has a degree in criminology. And like I said, he has extensive experience dealing with the prison system all over the world. And, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll get to his... Um, I'll get to the prosecution's uh, treatment of him, but let's start with the defense. So, you know, um, the first thing that, that Lewis remarked when he was being cross-examined by uh, Fitzgerald was that it is very significant what the Trump administration is doing going after Julian Assange because this is a very stark demarcation from Obama's tenure, right? So, once again, the evidence did not change, okay? The only thing that changed is the administration, the leadership, the people at the top running Washington, D.C., and they have, you know, very different or, uh, sh shall we say, more far-reaching views about what to do with whistleblowers and uh, leakers and publishers and journalists. And, you know, w he's not the first expert witness to say this, right? I mean, Trevor Tim uh, underlined this point. Almost every one of the witnesses has said, like, look, Obama did not pursue this because there were no legal grounds to do so. And nothing has changed. The evidence has not changed, you know. So this ascertains, this proves that it's a political witch hunt. That's it. Um, so, again, as I pointed out here, they went after Chelsea Manning, but not Assange, right? And, and Lewis, he reasserted that in the United States, no publisher has ever been successfully prosecuted for publishing national security information, right? So, you know, you can look at Julian Assange himself as an example that Obama did not pursue this. You can look at the Pentagon Papers, as he mentioned, that nothing was done about that. And, you know, 
in 2013 in the Washington Post, once again, he referenced the same article that we were talking about last week in court. So you can, you can see here the Justice Department has all but concluded it will not bring charges against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange for, published class of, for publishing classified documents because government lawyers said they could not do so without also prosecuting U.S. news organizations and journalists, according to U.S. officials. Okay? So there were no legal grounds to do this on, and, and that's it. Um, another very important point, which, again, we've heard this brought up by the previous expert witnesses, is that it's not just a question of charges being brought, but also the rhetoric and the statements, the comments that have been made. So, I mean, Trump himself uh, said that Julian Assange should suffer the death penalty, right? I mean, this is insane. Look, remember this? <laughs> should be like the death penalty or something. <laughs> is it ridiculous? And it's not just him, right? Uh, the former attorney general, Jeff Sessions, he also said that arresting Julian Assange is a priority. Yeah. And if you remember uh, Mike Pompeo, he's made several statements. Uh, he said that the other day I was talking about this when he, he said that Julian Assange has no First Amendment rights because he's sitting all the way in London. <laughs> Yet they want to prosecute him with U.S. law while denying him any rights and privileges under U.S. law. And it's not just that, of course, you know, the more inflammatory comments that Pompeo has made, for example, when he was uh, giving a speech at CSIS in 2017, he, he said that WikiLeaks is a non-state hostile intelligence service. I mean, you know, that's <laughs> it's nothing short of a declaration of war, essentially. Right. So here I posted a, an excerpt of that that speech. You can you can see here. Mike Pompeo said, quote, it is time to call out WikiLeaks for what it really is a non-state hostile intelligence surface, often abetted by state actors like Russia. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, just making up wild claims. So, um, moreover, okay, the issue here is that what the Trump administration is doing, I quote, this is what Lewis said. He said it's, an abuse of criminal law enforcement. Absolutely right. Why? Because, as we said, the evidence did not change. You know, the U.S. have essentially had 10 years to prepare a case, uh, if they really wanted to, if they could. The evidence has not changed. Only the leadership has. And the prosecution is done at the discretion, at the direction of the president, right? So ultimately, the president... He not only has the power to pardon um, someone or commute their sentence, but also equally in the, in the beginning, from the start, he can decide whether to pursue a prosecution or not, right? So this is clearly, as Lewis said, as Eric Lewis said, it's just an abuse of power. It's, that's all it is. So the, the underlying point, of course, being that this is a political witch hunt and has no legal basis. Neither in U.S. law, international law, U.K. law, EU law, any, any way you look at it. You, can't, you just can't play devil's advocate here. Um, another important point about the ICC, this is very, very crucial. You know, Lewis ascertained that one of the other reasons why they're going after WikiLeaks is the Trump admin's disdain, you could say. Their disdain for the ICC. So... The International Criminal Court, I mean, just briefly, the U.S. is not a member, okay? They, they don't recognize it, and that's not just Trump, okay? I think Bill Clinton, he signed the Rome uh, statute, like, in you know, the last day in office, and then, you know, Bush refused to ratify it, et cetera, et cetera. So this goes back many administrations. Nonetheless, Donald Trump, I covered this back in June, if you remember, he issued an executive order that would allow the U.S. to sanction prosecutors who work for the ICC, right? So this was back in June when we covered this. Um, and, you know, just a few days ago, uh, rather two weeks ago, actually, I think it's 1st of September, if I'm not mistaken, it happened, right? So they, they went after um, the chief prosecutor at the ICC, so Ms. Ben Suda, and the head of the jurisdiction, okay? So um, this is a blatant attack on investigators at the ICC trying to stonewall their investigation into war crimes in Afghanistan. And of course, WikiLeaks exposed those war crimes uh, with the Afghan uh, war diary, with the Iraq war logs, just a slew, a, a, a plethora of war crimes, right? 
the torture programs, the drone strikes. So th this is bad news for any U.S. administration. But Lewis' point here is that not only is Donald Trump and, his, and the Trump administration, the Trump regime trying to go after WikiLeaks, but they have a really clear agenda when it comes to even prosecutors who work for the ICC at the International Criminal Court and even sanctioning them. So they want to really target anyone who stands up to the empire and exposes their, their crimes. Um, after that, the defense finished uh, cross-examining Eric Lewis, and then it was up to the prosecution. And here, once again, here we go. <laughs> right from the get-go, James Lewis, QC, who's the prosecution. I'm going to refer to him as prosecution, okay? So we don't get the names mixed up. So prosecution, once again, goes after the credibility of the expert witness. So we saw this with Mark Feldstein. We saw this with Stafford Smith. We saw this with Trevor Tim. It's always the same thing, right? The first thing he asks Eric Lewis, the first thing the, prosec the, first thing the prosecution asks Eric Lewis is, do you work for Assange? <laughs> Has Assange ever paid you? Are you paid to be here today? You know, trying to like ascertain that he's somehow biased or corrupt or bought. Ridiculous. Because they have nothing to go off of when it comes to the actual contents of the case and the counts that Julian Assange is facing. So, of course, their MO is to go after the credibility of the expert witnesses, right? So that's the first thing they started off with. Um, you know, moreover, what the prosecution did is ask Lewis about his previous comments regarding the extradition. So Lewis had publicly stated before that he's against this entire extradition and he criticized it. And the prosecution asked him, well, isn't that a conflict of interest since your political views are opposed to this hearing and you're testifying here today? And, and Lewis replied, well, no, because <laughs> I form my political views and my expert opinion independently. And I think that's very telling that you, you even have to ask this question because... Every single one of the expert witnesses is in agreement that this whole trial is undemocratic, it's unjust, it's illegal. And so that should tell you something in of itself. They all agree that this is a sham trial, that it has no legal basis whatsoever. So you have no option, I guess, in the prosecution's view, but to go after their credibility. It's, it, it's, it's insane. So... Yeah, this was also ridiculous. So the prosecution started asking him if he's ever written any articles or published any works on the prison system, on detainees, on, you know, and then asked him if they're peer reviewed as well. What, what a stupid question. You know, they're trying to ascertain essentially that he has no clue what he's talking about and make, make, try and making, trying to make Eric Lewis, the expert witness, look like a fool and... Like, he's not actually an expert. And he told him, listen, man, <laughs> the guy has a degree in criminology. That, that's what makes him an expert on this issue. And he's worked with detainees from Guantanamo Bay, and he's advocated for them before, which we'll get to in a second, giving you one of those examples. And the prosecution is out here trying to make him look like they have no relation to this case. No, no, this is ridiculous. So um, then we get to a very, very crucial issue regarding today's uh, hearing, the main topic, which was special administrative measures, right? And uh, administrative segregation. So when I covered the open letter by lawyers for Assange to the UK government, you know, we went through a multitude of points. Definitely go watch that video. It will give you such a clear understanding of what this case is, how illegal it is on every single level, international law, you know, EU law, UK law, US law, it's insane. And one of the things that they underscored is the fact that if Julian Assange were to be extradited to the US, he'd be placed under SAMs, under special administrative measures, right? So if I recall correctly, Bill Clinton passed this back in the 90s. And what it allows essentially is for the US government to just strip you of all rights, everything. Like they put you in solitary confinement. You're not allowed out. You're not, they will pick who you can actually receive as a visitor they listen into your conversations with your legal counsel so they strip you of client uh, attorney privilege everything it's it's like you know a totalitarian's wet dream that's what it is and that's what they're going to do to julian assange and this is we know this for a fact because ausa 
uh, Kronberg said this. He said Julian Assange will most likely be placed under SAMS, under special administrative measures. So it's not speculation or, you know, we're, we're afraid it might happen. It's most likely going to happen, unfortunately. And this is some of those inhumane, cruel uh, confinement and punishment that you can give someone. And keep in mind, he wouldn't even have to be convicted yet to be placed under SAMS or administrative segregation, right? So getting into that topic here... Um, Lewis, what he said, he told the court that if Julian Assange were to be extradited, there's a very high chance that he will be placed in Alexandria Detention Center, which is in Virginia, right? You got to remember the reason is Virginia is because <laughs> when they're going after whistleblowers and journalists, when they went after Chelsea Manning, for example, they always do it in the Eastern District Court of Virginia. Why? Because that's where the CIA is. You know, that's where they can make sure that the jury is going to be comprised mostly of people from the intelligence community. It's a done deal. Like, the case is going to be won in the favor of the government. So that's one of the reasons they do this. It's a sham trial, right? It's really just a sham pony show. So in Virginia, you have this maximum security prison and um, Alexandria Detention Center. And extremely likely that Julian Assange will be placed there, right? During pre-trial detention, keep that in mind. So he wouldn't even have been convicted of a crime yet, right? But nonetheless, he would be placed under these inhumane conditions. So it's very important to note that. And what Lewis talked about, because again, he's an expert in this field. He, he knows what he's saying. He said that under these special administrative measures, for example, prisoners, if you're a prisoner, you're not allowed out of your cell unless there are no other prisoners around. Yeah, they take the confinement, the solitary seriously. You're definitely on your own the whole time, even when you're let out of the cell. And their, his point was that just to stretch your legs, for example, or take a walk, you'd have to wait maybe till the middle of the night, till all the other prisoners are sleeping, so that you can be let out with no one else around. I mean, just kept in a cage, really. Kept in a cage. And uh, at this point, this was insane. The prosecution, so James Lewis QC, yes, with his anger management issues, you know, he all of a sudden just asked the judge to completely cut the video link that they had with Eric, with Eric Lewis, the expert witness. And then he starts having this exchange with the judge. And he's like, every time I, I talk to the expert witness, every time I, I question Lewis, he gives me long answers. And I can't abide by the time limit that you have given us. So... What he asked the judge for, what the prosecution asked the judge for, was no time limits to question the expert witnesses. It's ridiculous. And we saw this last week as well, where prosecution kept getting pissy and impatient at uh, the expert witnesses and telling them, answer my questions uh, <laughs> more concisely. You're taking too long. You know why? Because they want to lead them down a line of questioning. They just want yes and no answers so they can try and trip them up and frame their answers in a way that favors their, their bogus charges. So he just flat out cut the video link, had this exchange with the judge, and the judge, Vanessa Baracer, she told him, no, essentially. She said, I'm not removing the time limit. You got 30 minutes, and then that's it. So, you know, he apologized, and I mean, this guy seriously has anger management issues, right? And he apologized, and then they started uh, resuming the questioning. And at this point, you know, Lewis... He, he um, talked about the risk of Julian Assange's mental health worsening were he to be extradited. No surprise. It's already in poor, poor shape at this point. And he also made the point that, listen, Julian Assange, because we know for a fact that being holed up in the embassy for seven years and then in Belmarsh prison in solitary has worsened his mental health and also the political nature of his alleged crimes, of the war crimes that he exposed. These factors might lead to the government putting him under special administrative measures or segregated administrative segregation, right? So essentially it's, it's solitary confinement. And he made this point that it doesn't matter what you call it. It's still solitary confinement, right? And 
this is this is a real concern. You know, the government, the U.S. government, if they get Assange over there, they could just say that, oh, well, you know, for his own benefit, for his own good, we're going to put him in, in solitary because he has no notoriety, you know, he's well known. And for his own safety, we have to lock him in solitary. And then they might use that against him. Just to make him suffer even more. It's insane. So Lewis raised this point, which is very important. And... Um, Then we also got to the European Convention on Human Rights. So the prosecution, what they were trying to do here is, once again, discredit Lewis and at the same time try to portray what's happening to Assange as somehow abiding by international conventions and norms. And so they said that, listen, this extradition and bringing Julian Assange over to the U.S., it does not violate Article 3 and Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So Article 3, that's anti-torture and against inhumane treatment and article six that's the right to a fair trial and once again if you go and watch that video i did about the open letter from lawyers for assange they clearly outline how it, all of this and all of the previous treatment that julian assange has been uh, under not just what he might face in the u.s is all in violation of the european convention on human rights so this is a no-brainer but nonetheless the prosecution tr were trying to allege that oh well it's not in violation. And then they pointed to, to Lewis' record, once again, trying to discredit him. And they said that, well, listen, when Lewis was arguing in regards to the uh, European Convention on Human Rights about uh, Babar Ahmad, who was another UK citizen who ended up being extradited from the UK to the US, the court rejected his arguments, right? So they said that, the protests against his treatment and because you got to keep in mind, Babar Ahmad, this guy's story is insane. Like he was kept without charges. He was kept in jail without charges for nine years, I think. That's a record in the UK. Okay. That guy has been detained without charge longer than anyone in UK history that we know of. And he ended up being extradited to the US and put in this supermax prison. And at the time, the EU court at uh, Strasbourg, they okayed his extradition. So they listened to the appeal and they didn't accept that this extradition and what he was facing in the US would violate Article 3 and Article 6. And they okayed his extradition and he ended up being taken to the US. And then actually in the US, he was freed. I think he served just a year and the judge commuted his sentence and let him go. But that, that's a whole other story. And so the point here was that, well, the prosecution was trying to ascertain that, look, we've had Babar Ahmad come over to the U.S. before. He's also a U.K. citizen extradited, and he, that was not in violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. So therefore, what's happening to Assange is also not in violation of the European Convention of Human Rights. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Um, so once again, you know, Lewis, he brought up the fact that this is a political witch hunt, given the nature of the crimes that, uh, the war crimes rather, that Julian Assange exposed. And he said that putting Julian Assange in administrative segregation and under these uh, special administrative measures, you know, not only would it impede his ability to build a defense and actually meet with his lawyers because you get one phone call a month, I think, and you're not allowed outside your goddamn cell. The government controls who you can actually see with a pre-approved list. And if you actually have lawyers visiting you, they get to listen in on what you're saying to your lawyer. And he has personal experience with that, Lewis. He said that himself, right? So his point was that if Julian Assange is taken to the U.S., he won't be able to build a defense while he's under these SAMs. He won't be treated and given the right to a fair trial in any capacity. And moreover, his mental health will worsen. This will screw up his health even more, which is 100% true. And then this was, this was ridiculous because the prosecution, their response to this was that well, hold on a second. Julian Assange is not a terrorist, even though they're treating him like one. And so therefore, it's not likely that he'll be placed under special administrative measures. Uh, he'll be treated fairly. And they said that the attorney general, William, William Barr, he's the one who will decide whether to place Julian Assange under SAMS, and he'll do it as, at his own discretion and if it's pertinent to national security. Of course, they're going to put him under goddamn SAMS. What are you talking about, man? 
They said so. The federal prosecutor Kronberg said they were going to do it. <laughs> of course they will. The whole administration is coming out and saying that they're going to go after Assange and even kill him. So that, that was a garbage argument. And then Lewis, he quoted the warden of the Supermax prison, Florence, which is in Colorado. I think this, uh, what's his name again? Robert Hood. Yeah, so he was the warden from 2002 to 2005, I believe. And I'm going to show you a clip now where he was talking to CNN about the conditions in the prison and what it's like. And Lewis quoted him that being in the Supermax prison, which is where Assange will likely go if he's convicted, it's worse than death. So take a look at this clip. Let's watch it together. We're looking at people like Ramzi Yusuf, the 1993 World Trade Bomber. Uh, Timothy McVeigh was there. Nichols is still there. The shoe bomber, the unibomber, you can go on and on. You're designing it so the inmates can't see the sky intentionally. When it really hits you is that you're looking at the beauty of the Rocky Mountains in the backdrop. When you get inside, that's the last time you'll ever see it. As you're pulling up to this complex, there's shotguns in plain view, there's nine millimeters on this tear gas. They're going by uh, 12 gun towers, uh, and that's before you even say hello to anyone. You'll be in leg irons, a belly chain, handcuffs, and you're passing hundreds, hundreds of cameras. It's almost all concrete. You're gonna be in that box, these 84, square feet of room, most likely for the rest of your life, in my opinion, far much worse than death. You're looking at people. You heard it straight from the horse's mouth. I, this guy was running the prison. I think he's uh, more qualified than anyone else to speak on the conditions therein. And he said it's much worse than death. And look where they're putting him. I mean, just like in Belmarsh prison, they're cooping up Julian Assange with all these terrorists. You know, the worst of the worst, which just further proves that he's a political prisoner. I mean, could you imagine jumping bail and they send you to Guantanamo Bay? You'd be like, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The whole point was to buy time for the DOJ to file an indictment. So the same thing will happen if he gets extradited. Not only will he be in brutal, solitary confinement and inhumane conditions during pretrial, but even afterwards. If he gets convicted, they'll throw him in this can over here with all these terrorists. And you're going to tell me that this is not a, pol a political witch hunt. Are you serious? Get out of here, man. So the prosecution, once again, they start doing these mental gymnastics and they said that, well, hold on a second. Lewis, you shouldn't bring up Julian Assange's mental health because you're not a doctor. And so therefore you're not qualified to talk about mental health issues. What? This is ridiculous. It's a garbage argument because they know damn well that the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture visited Julian Assange in Belmarsh Prison not long ago with two other physicians. And they examined him and they said that he shows clear evidence of long exposure to torture. I'll read you the quote right here. I posted it, right? Here it is. So, the UN Rapporteur on Torture has reported and continues to report on the treatment of Mr. Assange as part of his United Nations mandate. So this is on 9th and 10th of May, 2019. Professor Meltzer and two medical experts specialized in examining potential victims of torture and other ill treatment visited Mr. Assange in Her Majesty's prison, Belmarsh. The group's visit and assessment revealed that Mr. Assange showed all symptoms typical for prolonged exposure to psychological torture, including extreme stress, chronic anxiety, and intense psychological trauma. The UN Rapporteur on Torture concluded Mr. Assange has been deliberately exposed for a period of several years to persistent and progressively severe forms of cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. The cumulative effects of which can only be described as psychological torture. So listen, man, the point here is that, you know, if, if a QC uh, James Lewis, he's so adamant on obtaining testimony and direction from licensed physicians, well, there you go. But conveniently, he ignores that, right? And tries to go after the extra witness's credibility. He says, stupid. They know damn well that Julian Assange is being tortured. They want to go even further if they bring him to the U.S. And so he tried to shut Lewis up, essentially, when he brought up the fact that these special administrative measures in which he's very familiar with 
would severely impact Julian Assange's mental health and, of course, physical health, right? Which go hand in hand. Nonetheless, when Lewis brought up the fact that, you know, on top of all of the extensive psychological torture, Assange has been diagnosed with Asperger's, the prosecution was like, well, yeah, we can make accommodations for people with autism. No, that's not the point. <laughs> and we know damn well they won't because Lewis himself said he has seen firsthand the fact that no one is catered to properly when it comes to mental health, when it comes to their health in general. The fact that they're going after Assange is an attack on his mental health, is detrimental to his well-being in the first place. Never mind what is potentially to come. And, you know, afterwards, um, the, the other very important point was that, which Lewis raised, is that even in the best case scenario, even in the best case scenario, let's say Julian Assange is only convicted of one count out of the 17, 18, right? That's still 10, 20 years in jail, which is akin to a life sentence at his age now, right? And that's in the best case scenario. We know damn well that that's not going to happen because he's going to be convicted by a jury made up of people from the intelligence community. And you have to consider also all the time he's already spent in jail, already been confined in Ecuadorian embassy, the time he's going to spend in pretrial before he even starts serving the sentence. They're not going to shave a day off of his sentence. And moreover, the thing here is that they expanded one count into 18 counts. I mean, technically speaking, they could have put all of this under one count in regards to the Espionage Act, which again does not apply to Julian Assange because he's not fucking American. And he wasn't in America. How are you charging him with the Espionage Act? He doesn't fucking work for you. He doesn't have your citizenship. This is ridiculous. Nonetheless, even then, instead of just putting it under one count, which would be 10 years in jail, no, they expanded it to 17, 18 counts. This is... And, you know, they threw in the cyber crimes nonsense and then all this uh, spam about, oh, he worked with LulzSec and all these hacker groups. Oh, my God. So at this point, uh, we had huge technical difficulties. You know, the whole uh, court, the video link system just broke. All of it. You know, you had Lewis, who was uh, put back on video, and he was, like, yelling, but no one in the court, actually in the Old Bailey, could hear him. Only people who were connected via video link could hear him, which was ridiculous. And, you know, the, the screen kept going black. And for two hours, they tried to fix the technical difficulties. I think they're doing this on purpose at this point. Like, I can't believe that the UK, which is one of the most allegedly developed countries on Earth, not only, not only is missing a justice system, but also court infrastructure. Every single goddamn day of this kangaroo hearing, you've had technical difficulties technical difficulties every single one and you have to consider this trial this this extradition hearing is supposed to wrap up september 24th we haven't even got through half of the witnesses there's 20 30 extra witnesses that are still left to testify and this is the second time where the judge just adjourned the court till the next day because an extra witness couldn't testify and finish so last time i believe it was um Feldstein, we had him connect at the end of the day, and then he had to continue the next morning. And now, Lewis couldn't finish his testimony, so he's probably going to have to finish it tomorrow. Nah, man, come on. This is nonsense. This is unacceptable. I mean, the whole trial is a sham in of itself, but you tell me they can't even set up a video link properly in 2020. During COVID, yeah, six months, everything is transitioned online. Everything was already online. What? No, I don't accept this. I don't accept this. This is one of the most important cases of the century, and you're telling me they can't set up a video link? Bull fucking shit. I don't buy it. No. I don't accept that. This is nonsense. So, you know, I... I <laughs> I joked here that maybe Crown Prosecution Service can ask UC Global if they'll lend a hand to fix the court video. I hear they have years of experience after spying on Assange for the CIA in the Ecuadorian embassy. Yeah, you know, <laughs> those cameras, conveniently, they worked. And they were, they were able to record and transmit all the way to the US. So that's about it for, for day five. 
I hope that was concise and informative. And that's it. That's the gist of it. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, once again, I'll be live tweeting. You can follow me to see what's happening as the trial, as the hearing unfolds. At Richie Medhurst, R-I-C-H-I Medhurst on Twitter. And afterwards, of course, there'll be a live summary in video form here on the channel. So I thank you all for tuning in. And if you have any questions, I'll gladly take your questions. Uh, thank you for sharing the video, liking the video, for spreading the word. You know, mainstream media, no surprise, they're not covering this in the slightest. Even independent media are slacking. It's really obscene. Oh, and by the way, you should definitely go and check out when I was on Vigil for Assange. That was great. You know, an hour and a half discussion. We talked about everything, not just, I mean, it was mainly about Assange, of course, but we also delved into foreign policy and the uh, progressives and Democratic Party. And it was really, really great. And we talked extensively about this trial. So definitely go and check that out. They do great work. And yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. So I'll, I'll, I'll gladly take your questions now if you have any um, and uh, any of your, your comments. So let me, let me just pull this up over here. By the way, we got 128 people watching, but only 105 likes. Please make sure you throw a shoe, you smash the like button, it helps with the algorithm. You know, this trial is not getting enough coverage as it is. So let's try and boost that help with the algorithm. You know, YouTube does not favor reporting on these issues as it were. So hold on, I, I, believe, I believe we got a super chat over here from Mona. Thank you very much, Mona. Let me just read this to you guys. Um, <laughs> says, you couldn't wait until my classroom stream is over. Yes, you, you should definitely cancel that to watch the summary of the Assange hearing. Yes, I concur. <laughs> I tried to stay up and read your updates. My ass fell asleep. Nonetheless, you're doing an awesome job, Richie. So thank you for all you do. You're the MVP and the motherfucking goat. Right back at you. Okay, kick in the door. <laughs> you finished the lyrics. Seriously, Mona, thank you. I really appreciate that. I really, I really appreciate the, the kind words. And Glory as well says, just another fair and speedy trial in this powerhouse democracy with a TM symbol. Yes, right? <laughs> with freedom bombs and solar power drones and the beacons of democracy back at it. You know, the, the duo is right here. Now, seriously, I'm really angry at this. You know, I can't help but watch this hearing unfold, this sham trial, and, and get angry at what my country is doing, what the U.S. is doing. This is BS, man. You know? It really is. It really is. It, sh it should frighten people, and it's got nothing to do with just being a journalist. Like, all of this stuff was done in the name of public good as a public service. It actually had real-world real world repercussions. It exposed mass graves, torture programs, deaths, and the people who put in the work and really got their entire lives turned upside down. Snowden, Manning, Assange, e even Glenn Greenwald, right? They, they, they harassed him and harassed his uh, husband. So they really risked a lot to tell us these truths. And we owe them a debt of gratitude. And I can assure you 100% that even though they're going through injustices now, the historical record will view them as heroes forevermore, without a doubt. Without a doubt. This is so important. And once again, I highlight the absurdity that Tony Blair and George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld and Jack Straw and all these war criminal bastards, these Blairites and neocons are walking free. And Julian Assange is being charged and put under a inhumane inhumane conditions i mean you got to consider that tony blair for example they tried to per they tried to prosecute him for the iraq war and it didn't work you know why uk judges blocked it yeah oh yeah because technically speaking apparently there's no law in the uk that says <laughs> it's illegal to commit acts of aggression against other countries ah well that sounds like a pretty big gap that you have right there in the 
in the legal system. How convenient for Tony Blair. So UK judges blocked that, even though he blatantly, clearly violated international law, committed war crimes. And he gets off scot-free, right? But Julian Assange, who exposed Tony Blair's war crimes, George Bush's war crimes, Obama's war crimes, Trump, all of them, they get, you know, he gets punished. Manning gets punished. Snowden gets punished. This is obscene. You know, I will say one thing, and I want to cover this in, um, in a separate segment. Although, yeah, I'll do a separate segment on it because it, it really is worth uh, diving into extensively. But a uh, new interview came out. It's actually an old one, but it just finally came out. We're finally able to watch it where Julian was talking about the cables uh, that WikiLeaks published. And, you know, at one point he said, um, even though he has to worry about being extradited, because, for example, when he went to speak at the UN in Geneva, um, you know, they had to call up lawyers in Switzerland and find out what the political climate is like and if there's a high risk of him being extradited and, you know, having to tread very lightly and worry about if he can even travel to that country. And Julian said that what makes him happy, though, is that Donald Rumsfeld also has to worry about shit like that because he might go to a country and end up being extradited or tried for war crimes. And I was like, yes, exactly. <laughs> that, that, that is quite satisfying, I must admit. So, you know, once again, what they did, what they published, absolutely critical. So we, we owe them a debt of gratitude for that. There you go. Um... The U.S. empire in decline, and they're trying desperately to just play whack-a-mole with anyone who poses any kind of resistance to their crimes. And the U.K., the U.S., uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, these countries are not just complicit in the invasions of Iraq, of Afghanistan in mass surveillance, but also in impeding any kind of semblance of justice, right? So they're more than happy to investigate WikiLeaks. I mean, you got to consider back then Julian Assange, for example, before um, any indictment was put forward by the U.S., the Australian police, the Australian government were bending over backwards to rummage through his things and, and try and catch him with something and go after him. And they ended up dropping those investigations, right? So... Once again, you're seeing this now with regards to China. The, these countries are not just completely okay with helping out the United States and maintaining their hegemonic uh, stranglehold over the planet militarily, but also when it comes to things like mass surveillance and anyone who exposes mass surveillance and anyone who exposes classified documents and, and leaks the truth. And they, they are more than willing to surrender their justice systems and their democracies to the U.S., Right? This is not a UK court, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, um, even beforehand, it's not like the UK legal system was perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but this is a UK court. You know, the UK is uh, sorry. This is a US court. It's the Department of Justice that's holding the gavel. Um, Vanessa Beretzer is working on behalf of the Trump administration, as far as I'm concerned. And moreover, if you look at Australia, for example, silence. Where is his government coming to his aid? You know. The U.S., for example, if this were happening to them, if one of their journalists were being tried in another country, they'd fucking invade it, right? I mean, <laughs> just look at the Hague Act, for example, which Bush passed, which gives the U.S., they, they just gave themselves the permission, right? Because Americans are so exceptional. They, they passed a law, I'm not kidding, that says the U.S. will invade the Netherlands if any American is ever taken to the ICC, to the International Criminal Court. Not, not necessarily a politician, any American, even a private, <laughs> any American, they will invade the Netherlands. Th this is an actual law. Go look it up. 2002, Hague Act. So, you know, they, they just... <sighs> Hopeless, man. The, these countries are all extensions of the DOJ and, and Washington, D.C. That's it. So, uh... We got another uh, super chat over here from Jackson Hinkle. Thank you very much. Says, incredible reporting, bro. I really appreciate that. And, and once again, thank you to everybody supporting the show. And please make sure you share the video so that other people can catch up on what's happening. You know, once again, this is being underreported by the mainstream media. And even independent media, they're not covering this as they should. And it's, it's really 
disgraceful. It's unacceptable. Once again, everybody, especially journalists, especially should be outraged about what's happening. You know, you'll have a lot of people come and say, oh, I'm all about principled rule of law, First Amendment, free speech, and then it comes to Assange and it's like crickets. Wow. And, and they work in politics and journalism. Wow. That didn't last long. Anyway. Anyway. So... That, that's, uh, that's about it for day, day five. Again, we'll be back tomorrow. Follow on Twitter, Richie Medhurst, R-I-C-H-I Medhurst for the live updates. And then we'll have a video summary on the channel, okay? Thank you again for your support. If you want to support independent media, by all means, please do so. You can just scan, um, just scan any one of these QR codes, Venmo, Cash App, PayPal, and support the show that way. And of course, on Patreon, we are almost at our goal of 300 members. We're at 287 right now. We're just 13 members away. 13 members away. We got 129 people watching right now. I'm sure that we could get 13 more to support the show. So thank you very much for that. And uh, again, you can give as little or as much as you'd like and continue to support independent journalism, anti-imperialist commentary. So thank you very much for all your support, for tuning in. And as I said, we'll be back tomorrow or sooner. I might have some more stories for you in a bit. But uh, as far as the Assange hearing goes, that's day five. And I thank you all again for tuning in. See you tomorrow. Be safe. Take care.